Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, what I'll have you do, we're going to be in verse 23, you know, just that one verse for our text. But also, just keep a finger in Exodus chapter 1. So if you could have, maybe just throw a marker in Exodus chapter 1. And then Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to look at both of those because in Exodus 1 and 2, we find the, the account that is referenced in, in Hebrews 11, 23. And so those of you with electronic Bibles, can you do that with an electronic Bible? It's not quite that. Yeah, it's a little harder. Uh, now, Ron, be careful. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I just got to give you a hard time, but... Anyway, <laughs> all right, so Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to look at verse 23. The Bible says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Our Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the grace and the strength that you offer to us. And I pray that you would encourage us to take advantage of that this morning through your word. I pray that you would strengthen us, and I pray that you would help us to look to you in faith uh, in, in, a, in a crowd of any size. Uh, I know our crowd is never huge, but in a crowd of any size, there are many number of difficulties and, and, and uh, unfavorable situations we might face in, in our different areas and spheres of influence. And God, I pray that you would help us by faith in you to shine as a light in the darkness in the different areas uh, of our lives. And I pray by your grace and by your Holy Spirit, you would make your word live in our hearts and speak to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Five-year-old Johnny was in the kitchen when his mother was making supper. And she asked him to go into the pantry and to get her a can of tomato soup. But he didn't want to go in alone because it's dark in there, he said, and I'm scared. She asked again, and he persisted. Finally, she said, Johnny, it's okay. Jesus will be in there with you. So Johnny walked hesitantly over to the door and opened it, and it was dark in there, and his little heart was filled with terror, and he was about to turn around and go back to his mother again when he had a great idea. And he stared into the darkness and said, Jesus, if you're in there, can you hand me a can of tomato soup? <laughs> One summer night, Johnny's mother was tucking him in uh, during a severe thunderstorm, and, and uh, she was about to turn out the light when he said, and he asked in a trembling voice, Mommy, will you, will you uh, stay with me all night? She smiled and and his mother gave him a, a warm, reassuring hug, and she said tenderly, I can't, dear. I have to sleep in Daddy's room. There was a long, a long silence, which was eventually broken by a shaky little voice from Johnny saying, The big sissy. <laughs> Fear affects us. Fear changes things that we want to be. And, 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 and it really can change our own behavior. God does not want us to be dominated by fear. In fact, we cannot serve God and live in fear at the same time. It doesn't work. Jesus uh, said to his disciples who cried out to him, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? And he says, how are you afraid? What's wrong with you, old you of little faith? That's a paraphrase, but uh, how can you be afraid, oh, you of little faith? He balances on either side of that equation, faith and fear. Uh, so we, we cannot serve God and live in fear at the same time. In uh, first century Jewish believers who were the original readers of this, of this book to whom it was written, they were pressured to walk away from Christ, to walk away from the church, in Hebrews chapter 11, to encourage them, the Holy Spirit calls one witness after another to take the stand and to testify to the fact that Jesus Christ uh, is faithful and that he is the Christ and that believers must endure all these trials of life and endure in him to the end. 
In Hebrews 11 and verse 23, Moses' parents take the stand. We read Moses' name in that verse and we immediately begin to think about Moses, but this verse is not about Moses, it's about his parents. They take the stand and their example is given. And, and uh, they had every human reason to fear and to obey the king's commandment, which was to kill Moses. And they refused to do that, though. They, they risked death. They risked punishment to save this child alive. Why did they do that? Faith. That's why they did it. They did it by faith. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Jacob and his sons had come in to live in Egypt when Joseph was there. And, and, and Joseph at the time was the prime minister, but Jacob died, and Joseph died, and all of his brothers died. And, and the Pharaoh who knew Joseph died. And time passed, and Israel grew from a large family into a great people group there in Egypt. New leadership came in Egypt, and the new Pharaoh enslaved the children of Israel. But the Egyptians, in spite of that, they were afraid of Israel. Israel was multiplying too quickly. And if they continued this way, they could pose a threat to national security. And so in order to control Israel's population, by the way, any time a government starts talking population control, it's time to vote them out, right? Uh, but they, in order to control Israel's population, Pharaoh made a decree that all male children born to Israel must die, must be cast into the river. And we find that account in, in Exodus chapter 1. If you're there, just flip back over there real quickly. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 15. Exodus 1, 15. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other was Pua, and said, when you do the office of midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have you done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. And, and Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river. And every daughter you shall save alive. So Pharaoh, the, the government, commanded the Hebrew midwives to kill every male baby in Israel. But the midwives feared God, it says here, so they are exercising great faith also. And they saved these babies alive. And so Pharaoh adds another law. And the, the, here's the next law. He says this time he's going to, by force of law, he's going to put pressure on the parents themselves, not just the midwives. And so no matter what the midwives did, the government now required these parents to cast their newborn boys into the river. If, if, uh, if, Hebrew, if Hebrew parents were caught with a baby boy, the penalty would be severe. And this is the environment into which Moses was born. We look at Exodus chapter 2 and verse 1. There was a man of the house of Levi. He took a wife, a uh, daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took him, took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And, he laid it in the fig, and, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done with him. 
And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself in the river, and her maidens walked along the river's side. And when they, she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And we learn from Exodus chapter 6 and verse 20 that Moses' parents were named Amram and Jochebed. And, and when Moses was born, they were faced with a choice. Amram and Jochebed were faced with a choice. They could cast Moses into the river and avoid all these penalties following the law of the land, or they could keep Moses alive and hide him from the authorities, risking property, life, pain, and the safety even of their other children. It says here that uh, he's got a sister. So Amram and Jochebed choose option number two. They risked everything to keep their baby boy alive. But after three months, they could no longer hide the baby. Babies don't tend to want to be hidden. In fact, they like to cry. In fact, we were in Walmart yesterday, and we could hear a baby crying as we were checking out. And the thing was, we were on one side of Walmart, and the baby was all the way over on the other side of Walmart. And it was that hungry cry. Those of you mothers know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, there's a difference between I'm throwing a fit and I'm hungry. And it was that I'm hungry cry. And somebody was trying to check out, and they obviously couldn't feed the baby at that moment. And the baby disagreed. Uh, and that's, that's why Moses and, or not Moses, um, Amram and Jochebed eventually got to the point where they said, we can't hide him anymore. Because uh, they went to Walmart and he cried. But uh, anyway, but uh, so... She put Moses in this basket, and she sets him afloat in the river. Now Pharaoh's daughter found the basket. She looks inside, and there is baby Moses. And at that moment, he began to cry. I wonder if God told one of his angels, pinch him. <laughs> you know, and he began to cry. And the princess was moved with compassion toward this baby. And Warren Wiersbe puts it this way, and I love this, how he states this. He says, a baby's tears were God's first weapons in his war against Egypt. What powerful weapons here. And, and Miriam, Moses' sister, is watching all of this happen. She's hidden. She's watching uh, Moses. And so she approaches the princess, just shows up out of nowhere, right? And she says, uh, hey, I can call you a nurse for this, for this baby. And so the princess does that. She goes and calls, of course, her mother. And so look at this. Princess... The princess of Egypt pays Jochebed to raise her own son, who her father commanded that they should kill, uh, and, uh, and now he's a protected son of Egypt. And though Moses would be educated in all of the best schools of Egypt, I think God made this happen because Moses was going to be a leader of a nation, right? God is working these things out. He would be educated in the finest schools of Egypt and probably in Egypt's religion, but he spent his most formative years in the arms of his mother, who no doubt taught him all about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and his promises to his people. Isn't it amazing how God works? The problem is that we cannot see the whole story of our lives in the same way that we can see just in a few chapters how God works in Moses' life. We, we can't see that when it's time for us to make a big decision. When, when it's time for us to risk th something in order to obey God, we can't see how it works out in the end of the story. And so we read the beginning of this story and think, oh, of course, Jochebed and Amram, uh, they should disobey the government. It'll work out. And God is going to do great things through them. We know this. We have confidence in them. In fact, last night when I was... When I was uh, prying my eyes open to watch the Michigan and Michigan State game, um, I had already seen the score before I watched. It was more fun, honestly, to watch the game that way because Michigan State would score and they'd, they'd be all happy and stuff. And I'd just look at them and think, you guys are going to lose. <laughs> you know, why? Because I knew the end of the game. Now, if I'd been watching that live, I'd been biting my fingernails off. It was a close game. Um, 
And we read the Bible that way because we know the end of the story. We're not nervous. We, we, we don't enter into sometimes the, the conflict in, in, in a real way that, that, that these real people are in. They couldn't see the final score. For all they knew, they could get caught and severely punished, maybe even killed for this act of faith. And because we cannot see how everything works out in our lives, the natural thing happens. We are tempted to fear. In the time we have remaining this morning, I, I want to make one simple proposition to you. And though it seems like a proposition we should all accept at face value, I cannot just say it. Because if I do, the chili won't be ready when we get home. But uh, no, I can't just say it and leave it at that, even though we would not in agreement with it. Our heads would agree, but our hearts resist this truth. We want to agree, but the strong temptation is to say, at least subconsciously, I don't buy it. And so I, offer, I will offer a defense for my proposition. So here's what I propose this morning. It's pretty simple. It's not clever, but... This, God wants us to serve him by faith without fear. God wants us to serve him by faith without fear. To fear is to live outside of God's will for your life. Faith is an action that cannot be separated from an attitude. And the action is obedience to God rather than men. And the attitude is fearlessness. God wants us to serve him by faith without fear. Before we go further, I need to clarify what I mean, what I mean by faith without fear. Because no fear at all is presumption and arrogance. A person who lives without fear usually does not do so for very long. That's why the concept of no fear must be attached to faith and they cannot be separated. Uh, there, there was once a small and ignorant cocker spaniel and um, the dog compensated for his small size and great opinion of himself by uh, being obnoxious and arrogant. And so the, he, he began chasing a school bus one day and as it was pulling away from the bus stop and the lumbering vehicle, in his mind, he began to think, that bus is obviously retreating from me uh, and it is scared by my ferocious bark and my bared teeth, thought the Cocker Spaniel as he chased the bus. And feasting on his own bravery, the little dog lunged and bit one of the wheels. And that was the last thing that brave little dog ever did. You know what? There's a line between brave and stupid. And if it is not faith that drives out our fears, we risk crossing that line. Bravado is not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about faith without fear. And so for many of us, though there is no risk of, there's no risk of, of presumption sometimes for, for many of us. The, the risk sometimes runs in the opposite direction. And we are liable to be paralyzed, to be inactive. We tend to resist any risk at all, even when God commanded us to risk all for his kingdom. God wants us to serve him by faith without fear. The Bible is replete with, with, uh, with examples of this. I, in my study notes from this week, I have probably just two pages full of just, just scripture references. Let me give you a couple of them, all right? Psalm 118, verse 6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? There's a good one. Matthew 10, 31, Jesus said, Fear ye not, therefore, ye are more value than many sparrows. Luke 12, 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. It sounds to me like God does not want us to fear. Not only that, but God desires that we serve him. These two concepts cannot be separated, and that is why Jesus called his disciples to service in this way. He said to Simon, fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. He didn't just say, he didn't just say hey, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. He said, first, fear not. 
Fear not. In Hebrews eleven twenty three, our text, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. The faith of Moses' parents moved them to action. They did what God required of them to do. They hid. They hid their baby for three months. Now, that doesn't seem too brave. I mean, we don't watch great emotionally moving movies about people who hide, right? Um, but it, it, it doesn't seem too brave. It also doesn't seem like an action filled with a lot of potential for, for impact for God's kingdom on this world. But think about the impact of what they did. This action of Amram and Jochebed some 3,500 years ago is still impacting us today. Through their obedience, God raised up the prophet Moses who led Israel out of Egypt and then God used Moses to write the first five books of the Bible. And if you have a plaque of the Ten Commandments in your house, you can appreciate the faith of Moses' parents. Then they hid Moses by faith because they knew it was the right thing to do. They knew it was God's will and they also did it because they did not fear the king's commandment. And think about that. The government was against their identity and their faith. And Amram and Jochebed, they lived in a hostile world, a world where their faith had become illegal and their identity suppressed, and yet they were free to serve the Lord. They did not act recklessly. They, they, weren't, they weren't acting just to be rebels. They hid Moses. They did not display him and brag about their gravitas. They took the proper precautions. Our text says that they were not afraid of the king's commandment. What does that mean? It, well, it, it doesn't mean that they never considered the consequences. Even Jesus said to his disciples that they should count the cost. Now, he said they should accept the cost too, but that they should at least count the cost. And, and it doesn't mean that when Moses cried that his, that his mother didn't cover his mouth in hopes that one of Pharaoh's soldiers didn't hear. What it does mean is that they were willing to risk losing everything in order to obey the commandment of God. And so this is my proposition this morning. God wants us to serve him by faith without fear. Do you buy it? Do you believe that? Now, we believe it in our heads. And this, in our heads, the concept is obvious, but our hearts resist. So I want to defend this proposition against the protests of our hearts. God wants us to serve him by faith and without fear. And to defend this proposition, I'm going to ask and answer two questions. The first question is this, why without fear? Why without fear? And that is because fear enslaves us to inaction. Why without fear? Fear enslaves us to inaction. Why must we have the mastery over fear to serve the Lord? And that is because fear will not settle for second place in your heart. Fear seeks to be a master. And it is a cruel master. Fear seeks to rule over you. During the Passover feast at Jerusalem, everybody was talking about Jesus. When he walked on this earth, in John chapter, uh, John chapter 7, it was time for the Passover, and people were wondering where Jesus was. And some people were saying that Jesus was good, and others were saying that Jesus was a deceiver. But they only spoke of him in whispers. Why? Well, because they were afraid John chapter 7 verse 13 said, Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. <laughs> That's what fear does. It suppresses action and it slaves us to inaction. Here was a whole city full of people. They all wanted to talk about Jesus and all they could muster was a whisper. Because they were afraid of the authorities. The people were, were afraid of what the Jewish leadership would do to them if they were overheard speaking openly about Jesus, so they just didn't. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. So, 
Um, by the way, what causes us to fear? What causes us to fear? Desire. Desire causes us to fear. Paul Tripp has put it this way. Fear is the flip side of desire. For example, if I desire your acceptance, then I fear your rejection. See how that works? Why do people fear a cancer diagnosis? Well, that's because we desire to be healthy. And we desire to live free of that headache of a mountain full of medical bills and all of the things that go along with that. That is, uh, that is uh, fear expl explaining what's on the flip side, and that is desire. Desire causes us to fear. And what is it that we fear? We fear loss. We fear losing something. When I, when I watch just, like, when I, 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 we got home from, from uh, was this last week? Uh, we got home from church last week, and, and it was the second half of the Super Bowl, so I turned it on. And I was completely comfortable watching the Super Bowl. You know why? Because I didn't care who won. I, mean, I, just, I was just watching a football game. I didn't have, didn't have a dog in that fight. I was not nervous. And I, the, the reason why, why I wasn't afraid of anything was because I had nothing to lose. My team couldn't lose. They were out of it already a long time ago. Um, and so we, we, when we are afraid, we fear loss. We fear losing something. If we obey the Lord in some area that makes us noticeably different from the world, we fear that we might lose some friends or opportunities in this world. We fear the loss of money. We fear the loss of reputation. We fear the loss of a career or happiness or love or, or comfort or so many other things. We fear losing. People sin in seeking revenge because they fear the loss of justice. I've been done wrong. I must make it right. What does fear do? It enslaves us and it paralyzes us. Because we fear that we might lose something precious, we fear to take any action that would perceivably put that thing at risk. We, we fear to take any action in obedience to the Lord that would risk the thing that we don't want to lose. For instance, we fail to take action to witness. What if I don't know what to say, says fear. What if I start this conversation and they ask a question that I can't answer? You know what that is? That's fear of losing, losing face. <laughs> uh, what if they get mad at me? There's fear again, fear of losing comfort. What if, if, if people think I'm nuts? Fear of losing reputation. Fear of losing respect. We fail to take action against the misplaced priorities of our culture. We fear getting left out. We fear missing out. We fear for our kids to miss out on opportunities. We fail to take action in many areas of serving the Lord. Why? Because we fear serving the Lord will not be as rewarding as the scheme that we set up for ourselves. And so we seek our own safety net in our own schemes and our own schedules. I have never desired, my wife and I were just talking about this the other day, I have never desired to go to Africa. Never. Never. Still don't. You give me the choice between Siberia, Antarctica, or Africa, and I will choose Siberia or Antarctica. And I don't want to go there either. But Africa is pretty. But we have these things called pictures. And I can look at them. Right? I don't want to live there. I don't want to visit. I don't want to go on a safari. I never want to go to Africa. That's a real wood pulpit, right? All right? When I began dating my wife, she had just returned from a missions trip to Zambia, Africa. And man, she was fired up about it. She was super fired up about it. And this, of course, sent terror down to the deepest, innermost reaches of my soul. She made me wonder if God was using her to call me to Africa as a missionary. Plus, every time I look at a map of Africa, my name is written right in the middle of it. There's the country of Chad, Africa. Right in the middle of the continent. 
wondered if my mom called me to Africa <laughs> by naming me that. Then our church had a huge missions conference. And throughout that week, I felt the Holy Spirit convicting my heart. It was like God was saying to me, I want you to surrender. I want you to be willing to go to Africa as a missionary. I resisted. I was scared. What did I fear? Well, I feared losing the comforts of here in America. That's the major reason why I don't want to go to Africa right there. All right? I don't like big, scary critters. And I don't like roving bands of Muslim terrorists. I don't want to be exposed to that or have my family exposed to it. I feared going on deputation. I feared separation from family. I feared most of all the loss of my real dream, and that was to be a pastor in America. That was my dream. That was the desire God had put in my heart. That had been my desire for years, and it was my biggest fear to lose that. Finally, on the last day of that missions conference, I prayed and I surrendered to the Lord and I told him I was willing to go to Africa and immediately all the conviction I had been feeling vanished. It was gone. That day, God confirmed my calling in my heart to be a pastor here in America. I've never doubted it since that day. God wanted me to take action to, to uh, overcome my fear, and to trust him completely. And I have found that he is good and that he is trustworthy. By the way, if he had called me to Africa and I had gone, then I'm sure he'd take care of me. God wants us to, be, to serve him by faith without fear. And, and we have asked and answered that first question, why without fear? Because fear enslaves us to inaction. Now let's consider the second and last question. Why faith? Why faith? The answer to that question is because only faith sets us free from fear. Only faith sets us free from fear. Fear enslaves us and we have no power to set ourselves free from that fear. Self-confidence gives us the illusion of freedom, but it fades in the critical moment. Self-determination seems to like the key, but then it also falls short. And plus, both of those things are only an illusion. Only faith in Christ sets us free from fear. How is that? How does that work? Faith transfers all of our fears to Christ. Faith, faith transfers all of our fears to Christ so that he is responsible for what we lose. You understand that? If we lose, it's his fault. Or, let's put it this way, it's his doing. And he's responsible now to help us cope without what we lost. We fear losing something. Jesus says, trust me and be willing to lose everything. In Matthew 10, 39, he words it this way. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Can you lose anything more than life? That's all. He's, 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 he's saying all. In, in, some, so in some situations, this can be literal. Christians can lose their physical lives as a consequence of following Christ. It is littered throughout church history. It's littered throughout all, all history. And it is still going on today. In every other case, we stand to lose our lives in a different way. We lose the worldly desires, the things that we desire in, in our lives. And yes, in so many cases, we fear this loss. Why do we fear this loss? It ultimately comes down to faith. We fear this loss because we believe that the life that we have to lose is better than the life God desires to give us. And that is a faith issue. It is a matter of trust. And this is the very definition of lacking faith. To believe that the life we would lose is better than the life that we would gain in Christ. Faith is ultimately grounded here in the trust of God. 
Faith trusts God's ability and power. Faith trusts God's promises and God's word. Faith trusts the gospel, believing in Christ alone for salvation. Ultimately, faith puts trust in God's character, believing that God is good and that God will never do anything wrong by us. Take into account that that does not mean that life will be easy. That does not mean that we will never feel the pain of what we lose. Now read the book of Job. Read Psalm 88, where the psalmist despairs of his life, but cries out to God. You know what the last word in Psalm 88 is? Darkness. He finds no solution. No solution. Goes through the whole psalm, crying out to God to help him, and finds no help other than God is bearing him through this walk of darkness. Ultimately, though, faith trusts in God's character. See, we, we look at life realistically and say, yes, we, we, we lose things. We suffer. We are afflicted. But ultimately, God will not do wrong by us. God will walk. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of prosperity, thou art with me. No, that's not how that goes, is it? Wouldn't be very poetic, would it? Believing that God is good and that God would never do anything wrong with us. That's trusting God's character. And in this way, we can trust that whatever desired thing we lose by following Christ, he will give us something better, whether in this life or the next. Some people hear the next life and they think they got shortchanged. No. No, that's the best reward. That's the, best, that's the one that lasts forever. We are free from our fear only as we fear the Lord. See, the, the key to, to victory over fear is not the absence of fear. It is the transfer of fear. From fearing man and fearing loss and, and, and fearing all of the unknown to fearing God. You will always have fear in this life. The question is not, will I fear? The question is, who or what will I fear? The fear of the Lord is the essence of, of faith. It sets us free. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. When Peter and John preached the gospel in Jerusalem, they were arrested by the authorities. The authorities threatened them, and they... and. Um, and with the full force of the law behind them, they commanded these apostles not to preach Christ. How did they respond to that? Acts 5.29, Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. In other words, they did not have the freedom of speech. They had no constitutional right to speak freely the gospel. They were told not to. Were they free to... Speak the gospel? Yes. Did they? How do I know that? Because they spoke the gospel. All right? Um, they were the freest men on earth. Ultimately, it is not our faith, but our God who sets us free. In Exodus chapter 2 and verse 3, Jochebed, Moses' mother, she disobeyed the king's edict, but it, it became impossible to hide that baby any longer. So she comes up with a plan, and look at her plan, Exodus chapter 2 and verse 3. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. Jochebed's plan was, dare I say, pathetic. <laughs> pathetic. It, what a stupid plan, All right? I'm going to save my baby's life by setting him adrift in a river? What did she expect to happen? Yet that's all she could come up with. So she took action and trusted the results to the Lord. Because you know what the, you know what the big deal is? It's not her cleverness. And it's, it's, it's not her, her, her brilliance 
that makes this happen. God worked through her faith. It was God who saved Moses. Didn't matter what she did as long as she acted and obeyed the Lord. That doesn't mean we should just try to not think things through, but... But basically, a lot of times when I halt in fear and come short of obeying God, a lot of times I'm just thinking, I can't come up with something good. (laughs) It is not our faith that saves us, though. It is God who sets us free from fear. And only he, he only does that as we put our faith in him. The scientist, Louis Pasteur, who invented pasteurization, it's reported that he had such an irrational fear of dirt and infection that he refused to shake anybody's hand. President and Mrs. Benjamin Harrison were so intimidated by the newfangled electricity installed in the White House that they did not dare to touch the switches. If there were no servants around to turn off the lights when the Harrisons went to bed, they slept with the lights on. Fear can mess with you. God wants us to serve him without that mess. To buy faith without fear. What is it that God wants you to do that you're afraid to do? I'm talking about things you know for sure to be God's will. Not just, you know, some kind of mystical feeling or something like that. But things you can go to the Bible and say, God wants me to do this. Are you afraid? Is there someone you need to forgive? You're afraid to forgive them. Because what will happen? If I offer forgiveness to this person, what will happen? How much more will they hurt me? Are you afraid to forgive someone? Are you afraid to witness to someone? Are you afraid to make things right with someone against whom you have sinned? What if I come clean and they won't forgive me? What if if I, I ask for their forgiveness and they use that as a weapon against me? What are you afraid of that God wants you to do? God wants us to serve him by faith without fear. We believe it in our heads. Let's buy into it with our hearts.